So I am not feeling well. I am rather sick. Maybe rather is an understatement. I'm feeling very sick. Uh, I had been traveling for the past few weeks, and even though I had tremendous amount of fun, it was exhausting AF. It was really exhausting, and probably I didn't care for the exhaustion because of the fun I had. But by the time I got back, I knew that the next day I was going to wake up with all the symptoms of our common cold. I feel really I'm, I don't know if I'm exaggerating the symptoms but I feel really horrible because of you know how this has messed up a lot of my personal plans but yeah anyway I'm sick and uh, for comfort I had been going to food and then a lot of entertainment so the past few days I had been indulging in lots of sweets and lots of entertainment rewatching Brooklyn Nine-Nine yeah <clears throat> So this got me thinking. Yeah, I mean, this is available to us today, and I'm very privileged to be in such a position where I can take a few days off, and I can just laze away my days and not care about any of my responsibilities, <clears throat> and just eat and rest and recover. Uh, when we were young, though, uh, our parents would put us on a really strict diet. We'd have. I used to have podiri kani and chamandi. and chiruvara kota yes for consolation my parents would always tell me a lot of stories too mainly stories from panchatantra so back then when i was a child to face a fever i did not need brooklyn nine nine or lots of food or entertainment a home cooked meal and a story to go along with it was perfectly fine the perfect combo i still remember uh, achan sat me on his lap and was feeding me a mix of rice sambar and uh, kovake mirkurti kovake is iv gourd for our non malayali listeners so neatly balled up into several bite sized pieces positioned around the circumference of the plate you know there was logic behind his choice for arranging my lunch in such a manner each urula as we call it in malayalam represented an animal there stood a bigger urula adorned with an extra chip and pickle at the front before we get into the panchatantra namaste namaskaram wherever you are this is your sick host pavana varma and you are listening to culture speak going back to my childhood lunch this was the adaptation of the ancient story from the panchatantra which was written around 200 bce shaping up on the plate of an unassuming home in kerala the bigger urala that i talked about the bigger urala was dimwit the lion to whom an animal from the jungle would volunteer as daily tribute Do you remember the story about Dimwit and the hare from Panchatantra? I'll just jog your memory. It was noon, it was meal time. The Lion King was hungry, but there was no sight of food. This has never happened before because as we mentioned earlier, every noon an animal would volunteer as tribute. The background is that the lion could go and kill whichever animal, but then the animals made a collective request for him to stop doing that because of course, predictable death over managing uncertainty 24/7. They offered to send one animal every day at noon as a meal to the king. He agreed and since then he stopped hunting. So his meal arrived at his cave every day at noon, but not today. The lion was getting increasingly impatient and hungry. hungry the worst stage to find a wild animal in but then he noticed a small animal slowly walking over to him how dare you arrive so late i am so sorry my lord the thing is i was a little bit delayed by this new lion in the jungle he wanted to hunt me and have me for himself but fear not I told him all right that I was going to meet you and offer myself to you. And then this lion had the audacity to say that a real lion king hunts his meal and that I should not bow to a mediocre weak lion like you with his words not mine. How dare this lion insult me? Take me to him this instant. My lord the other lion also wanted to meet you. Actually he spared my life so that I could deliver his message to you. He says that he is the new king of the jungle. 
Did he say so? My dear hair, lead me to that imposter. With all due respect, my lord, I honestly wouldn't suggest that. He looks incredibly strong and he lives in a fortress. <laughs> I wouldn't expect a puny head to understand pride. No one in this jungle can challenge me and live. Just lead me to this fake king of the jungle. Hearing this, the hare took the lion to the other end of the jungle. A stone well stood in a clearing. My lord, the other lion lives inside that fort. The lion climbed the wall of the well and looked down. There he saw the other lion looking back at him. The foolish lion did not realize that he was staring at his own reflection. He gave a huge roar. The roar echoed in the walls of the well and sounded even louder. And then the lion turned to the hare. You are right. This fellow is very strong. His roar is mighty. But don't worry. I will kill him in a jiffy. Saying this, the lion jumped into the well. He hit his head at the well's bottom and never came out. Years passed and I had forgotten all about Dimwit and the hare who not only outsmarted him but was able to kill him off without so much as a drop of blood on his hands. Today I come again in front of the Panchatantra driven by academic necessity. And honestly, I am shocked by the level of detail and thought that has gone into this body of fables. One would assume that the book is an anthology of tales, you know, a collection with one story following one after the other with a moral takeaway neatly placed towards the end. But no, no, what we have are stories in a series of nested Russian dolls with one story unfolding within another and often reaching three or four layers deep. It's like a literary inception. Honestly, I'm ashamed to have devoted exceptional seriousness to the Canterbury Tales, unaware of Panchatantra's influence not only on the Canterbury Tales, but also on Boccaccio's Decameron and La Fontaine's Fables. I'm uh, reading a translation of the closest relative to the original because the original version is completely lost. So reading this, I feel like the Panchatantra is wrongly targeted towards children. A good majority of the stories are unarguably inappropriate for children. And it's evident that only a select few from the broader artistic compilation have been cherry-picked and the reputation of the Panchatantra has regrettably been confined to these seemingly innocent narratives. Take for instance the story of the weaver and Princess Charming about a, a love-struck weaver who devises a plan with his friend to trick the daughter of the King of Gouda to, you know, being with him, you know what I mean. Uh, the princess is even sensually described and the story doesn't shy away from detailing things like bruised lips and passion-induced nail scratches on her body. Now, uh, here's a quote. When the queen had heard what the attendants attached to the apartments of the princess said they had noted, she was extremely agitated. Hastening to her daughter's private apartments, she looked carefully at the princess. Her daughter's lips were bruised by having been kissed with great ardour. There were nail scratches present on her body. Now, Sanskrit scholar Chandra Rajan explains that descriptions of bruised lips and nail marks on limbs was a literary convention at the time to indicate the depth of love and it should not be mistaken to be some form of sadistic enjoyment. Uh, now, Panchatantra's appeal towards adults should lie in the fact that it teaches the wise conduct of life without being preachy tales of selflessness or sacrifice. Uh, several Western scholars regard the Panchatantra to be even Machiavellian in nature. You know, all of these reasons is precisely why we should revisit the Panchatantra as adults, not as kids, but as adults, this is more important to us. You see, out in the world, advice is plenty on the virtue of patience, self-sacrifice and unquestioning loyalty. Not only are such sentiments far from being practical, they also stifle critical thinking and creating a herd that accepts the status quo. And what is the result? The result is a culture devoid of original thought and innovation. But the Panchatantra serves as a buffet of usable wisdom 
that is bound to help anyone at any stage in their life. It does not worry about being misunderstood because it's secure in the diverse world of animals and humans it has created. The original storyteller likely anticipated that the stories would shapeshift and integrate themselves into cultures, serving a purpose that was most useful to each culture. But despite the passage of two millennia and the countless retellings that have seen the genre evolve with each storyteller's spin, the foundational structure endures. The hare is as important as the lion, the monkey as important as the crocodile, and the dove as important as the man. In the Panchadantra scene, all animals are equal and none more equal than the others. So here's my advice to you. Go back and read the Panchatantra with your grown-up glasses. Uh, for me, the story of the monkey and the crocodile and about Gangadatta the frog, they are personal favourites. If you want a critical perspective, you can check out Chandra Rajan's version of the Panchatantra. There are lots of incredible commentaries and fun insights in that book. Interesting insights. I don't know if fun is the appropriate word. Anyway, that wraps up this week's episode of Culture Speak. I hope you're finding value in this podcast series. Thank you for listening. See you next time. A rich man's world. I have turned the song of this beautiful land. But that beautiful